Hi, I'm Ted Patterson of Critical Path Training. In this video screencast tutorial, I'm going to show you how to work with SharePoint projects and add SharePoint project items. Let's go ahead and get started. First, let's look at our test site. We have a brand new site on our local farm at internet.wingtip.com. So we're going to create a new SharePoint project and start creating some items to bring a business solution to life. So I take Visual Studio and I start it up and we'll start by creating a new project. Now this new project we'll call Movies. <clears throat> and the next thing it asks is what's the URL of your local test site and do you want to test and deploy this as a sandbox solution or as a farm solution? I'm going to pick sandbox solution. Now we have an empty SharePoint project. It has no SharePoint project items inside of it. So what I'll do is I'll choose add new item. And when I choose add new item and I look under the SharePoint 2010 folder, it shows me all the different SharePoint project item templates that I could use. So I could create a visual web part. I could create a regular web part, sequential state machine workflows. What I'm going to do for the first SharePoint project item is add a list instance. So let's say that we want to add a new list named Movies. So we'll go ahead and choose OK. Now when I add this new SharePoint project item, the SharePoint tools bring up a wizard that asks you a few questions. So what's the name? I want to call this Movies. What is the underlying list type? And I'm going to base it on the custom list. And then what is the URL you want this to be at? And we'll just say movies. And I can say add this list instance, quick launch bar. That sounds great. We'll go ahead and click OK. So now we've created this new SharePoint project item named movies. It has an elements.xml file with this list instance inside there. Now also note that it added a feature. And if I go and take a look at the feature that was created, well, we'll call this Movies. And note that I can switch this back and forth between scope to the site or scope to the site collection. I'm going to scope it to the site collection. The primary reason for that is that when I upload and activate this within a site collection, features that are scoped to the site collection level with scope equal site auto activate, but things at the site level will not. So once we have this set inside here, maybe I want to go ahead and do a test. I'm also going to take this particular feature and rename that to main site. And that's just an indication to me that it is a site collection scope feature. Now let's go ahead and bring up the output window. So when I run the deploy command, I can see what happens. I run the deploy command inside here. And as I run the deploy command, let's go back and see what happens. Hey, we've created a new list. So we've created this new list. And so let's go ahead and add some data. So we'll come back up here. And what's the name of my favorite movie? Obviously Jaws. So we'll go ahead and choose Save. And now we have that inside here. Now let's go back to Visual Studio. Now, I'm going to go back into the elements.xml file, and what I forgot to do is add a description. So I'll go ahead and add a good description inside here, and I want to retest my code. <clears throat> but now there's this issue, <clears throat> and the issue is I can't create a list named movies in a site where a list named movies already exists. But what we have with many of the different SharePoint project item types is something which is called deployment conflict resolution. So watch what happens when I go ahead and I choose deploy. The deployment conflict resolution for a list instance type is set to automatically prompt the user. Now the deployment conflict resolution is going to delete this, the list in the target site primarily so that it can activate the feature and create the new list. But it's going to make me say yes resolve automatically, that's fine. And so as I go back 
and I go ahead and look at the movies again, it basically recreated that from scratch. So every time I do a deploy, it's going to delete and recreate a new list for me. Now realize that everything about this deployment conflict resolution is just something that happens in the development environment within Visual Studio. If I switch the deployment conflict resolution to automatic, it's not going to prompt me anymore. However, do realize that it doesn't carry over to production code the ability to automatically delete things. So if you do need the list deleted beyond your development arena, you need to add code to something like the feature deactivating event handler. Now let's look at a little trick. When we're doing testing inside, if you have a list instance, we'll go ahead and we'll add in some default data because every time I recreate this, I don't want to have to go back and add data in again. So let's go ahead and add a row. And there is a field, and the name is title. And so we want to go ahead and add in our first movie. And then we'll add in a second movie. And what we have is a double feature, Jaws and a Farewell to Arms. Let's go ahead and do a deploy this time. And this time, when I add that inside here, let's go back and take a look at what happens. And now we basically have data inside of our list. So every time we do the recompile and redeploy, we have data that we can test. Now, let's go ahead and add a second list item. So this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up and I'm going to add a new item, which is an event receiver. So I want to put some event handlers behind our movies list. So we'll say movies list events. And we'll choose OK. And once again, it runs a little wizard. And it's going to automatically create an event handler an event receiver class for me. And notice that there's different types of events, but I want list item events. And this asks what type of lists. And so I could base mine on the custom list type. Now, when do I want to run my event handler? Every time a list is being added. So let's go ahead and choose finish. Now, one of the things that gets created for me, I'm going to go into the larger view here. And let's go ahead and get rid of these comments. It basically creates an event handling class for me. And so now I can just put the event handling code inside. Now, in addition to the event handling code, note that it created a elements.xml file. Let's go take a look at that. And one of the things that you can see here is it's created a receivers element. And inside there, there is a receiver element for this particular type. Now, one of the things that I have to do a direct edit to this file for is if I don't want my event handler to apply to every single list that was created from the custom list type, instead, I just want it to apply to one list. I'm going to go back here and pick list Earl. And we'll say list slash movies. And I basically point it to one of the lists that's going to be inside the target site. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead and move back to our event handler and write some code inside here. Now, let's say that I want to see the value that the user is putting inside here. So we'll say string value equals. Now, I'm going to take the properties parameter that's passed to me. And there is an after properties. When a user makes a change, after properties is going to have those changes. And so I'll refer to the title column. And also, we'll convert that to a string. And so now we can go ahead and take a look at the value. Now, let's say that we have a validation. What we don't want is when people add in titles. We don't want them to use the amber sign like Tom and Jerry. We want them to spell out the word and. So if this value 
uh, contains, and it contains that doggone ampersand. Well, that's not okay. And so what we want to do is we want to write some code that's going to disallow the user from making that change. So now we have that inside here. And so how do we roll things back? We'll say properties. And there is a particular um, property which I can specify whether it's valid or not. There's all types of different properties that we can use inside here to get at different things. But what we're going to do is we're going to use a particular property, which is cancel equals true. And once you set cancel equal true, you've basically prevented them from, you know, being able to be successful in writing that. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is to look at the status. Now, the status is set with an enumeration. And by default, even if I didn't write this piece of code, the default value would be cancel with error. But I just wanted to bring that out. Some of the other things that you can do is you can do cancel with no error, which basically doesn't write the value but doesn't give the user any indication that there was a problem. There's also a cancel with redirect URL, which instead of bringing up the dialog, which you're going to see in a second, you can bring up your own custom dialog. So we'll just leave it at the default of custom with error. And if you're going to say custom with error or leave it for the default, we also want to set the error messages. And the error message is uh, going to be do not use the ambersand character. OK, so now that we have this in place, let's go ahead and test out our code. So we'll come back up here. And we'll do a deploy. And after we do a deploy, let's go test our code. We'll come back here. And we'll try to put in something that has an ampersand. We'll go ahead and run this in. And as it tries to save us, you can see that that's the default experience that the user gets when you basically disallow something by setting the cancel flag equal to true. Now the user can try to add something in again. So this time the user will add in, you know, using the appropriate and instead of the amber sign, and then all of a sudden things are successful. Now let's add in one more event handler. Let's add in an after event and start instead of a before event. Now notice that this SPI for events, let's look at its property sheet. If I look at the property sheets there, there's a whole bunch of different types of handlers. So I've handled the item adding. Let's also handle item added. I'll go ahead, set that equal to true. Notice that it automatically creates the code inside the source file. I'll take a look at elements.xml. I'll also do a reformat right here. And so down here, you can see that I've got the item added handler in place. I didn't really have to even look at this file. I just want to show you what it's doing for you behind the scenes. OK, let's now come and write the code for this event handler. So for this event handler, it's an after event, not a before event. Now in this, let's say that we have this requirement that anytime someone adds something, we want to bounce the text to uppercase, it's just one of the um, one of the rules of our business logic. So what we can do is we can go to the properties and the properties has a list item. And so we can pull out the title. Now, after I pull out the title, what I might want to do is I might want to take that and set it to a particular value. So we'll say string value equals title dot to string. And then after we do that, we'll just write right back to the title by saying equals val dot. And then we'll have a to upper. Now, once I've done that, 
I can take my list item, and with a list item, we could say update. So I could call update, and if I call update, that's going to work fine in some scenarios, but there's this one scenario where your list has versioning turned on, and so a user makes a change, and that's one version, and then your event handler reformats the text. That's a second version. You don't want that. So what we probably want to use in this is the update overwrite version so we don't add a new version with what we're doing. Now, there's this other issue that we have to contend with, and that is this event handler fired because someone changed or added a list item. It is especially true if you have the item updated. So quite often, you have something like an updated event that might cause the event handler to fire every time it's updated, but the event handler updates the list, which causes it to fire again. So for some after events, we also have to worry about taking the event firing enabled flag and setting that to false as we do our work. And then after our work is finished, coming back and saying event firing enabled equals true. And realize that this doesn't turn off event handling in any scope larger than this request. What it's saying is, as this code modifies items, turn off event handlers to fire in response to those updates. Okay, now we've basically made our change right here. Let's go ahead and test it. So I'll come back here and we'll choose deploy. And this goes ahead and pulls the data out. We'll come back here. We'll take a look at these movies right here. And then now we're going to add a new movie. And so this movie, The Sun Also Rises. And as I click Save, I'm very disheartened to see that I don't see my changes. However, let's refresh the page. And it bounces to uppercase. So my code is working. However, after events are by default asynchronous. They work on a secondary thread, and the primary thread that's processing the page doesn't wait for it to finish before it grabs the value. So it grabbed the value before instead of after. So how are we going to fix this? We're going to fix this by now making another manual edit to our elements.xml file. I come back here, and inside of my receiver element for the item added, I'm going to come back up here, and if I keep going down, there is a new capability of after events added to this version, SharePoint 2010, where you can make after events synchronous. And this is the exact scenario where you want to do that. And so now that we've made our after event synchronous, let's go ahead and choose deploy and test it one more time. We'll come back here, and now we'll add something new, the sun also rises, and we'll go ahead and choose save. And you can see that before the user sees them, your event handler fired, did the processing on the text, and there will only be one version for the user's action, not two.